the idea that we can just be totally independent and self-responsible is I think just a way of feeling some sense of control and relief from the fact that we are really affected by other people. I thought we'd just start with um, you telling me a little bit about your background, what what you've been doing, your road to getting to where you are now and what you're doing now. Sure. So I, I never know where to start this story, but I guess I'll start it with, I, I find the transition between my old self and, and this road is probably the best place, which is uh, I followed in my little brother's footsteps and became a professional poker player. Um, I had one normal job out of college, which has been my really only normal job in my entire life. Um, and then I followed in my little brother's footsteps and became a professional poker player. And they tried to teach me how to make a living as a gambler. And I pretty quickly realized, which I think is like a principle of life that there's the way that you think something is going to be sort of the glamorous version of uh, what you think is going to be your experience of something. And then the reality of it, which is much, you know, more of a grind and much messier. And it occurred to me pretty quickly that like, okay, if I'm going to make a living as a professional poker player, I actually have to study poker math and poker game theory a lot of hours a day. Do I care about games that much? Right. And I don't mean that as like a judgment. I think that's a perfectly cool way to make a living, like strategy games, all that kind of stuff, I think is really cool. But I just was like, no, I, I don't care about games that much. So I had this kind of what do I care about? Um, what do I actually could it was like a process thing. What do I actually like doing for the sake of doing it? And the answer to that was the same as I think many people in the field of coaching or therapy, how they answer that question, which is I like talking to people about what's real for them. And then I had kids, uh, 2016, my first son was born and I started teaching this class, baby proofing your relationship at a nonprofit in San Francisco. And, um, that was kind of a side thing. Mostly I was just full-time coaching and, I did that, you know, I got kind of in that mode of like, what do you have to do to take care of your family, right? Like starting out in coaching, I was very much oriented toward the dreams, right? What am I building? What do I want to create? Like kind of more focused on myself. And then I became much more focused on being a dad and the energy of coaching and therapy and the energy of being a father can actually overlap quite a bit. I think just in how you have to, you know, we say hold space for people, you know, like just hold that grounded, attuned, solid place for both my children and my clients. And I hit this moment where I was having a conversation with one of my friends and he was like, you know, we're very different. I know I'm like an entrepreneur business person, but for me, if I were you, I just think what's the best product you have like what's the thing that you've the most developed that people want and that was baby proofing your relationship and so uh, my friend Cameron and I who had produced three master classes made this kind of master class style class together on demand class and since then I've basically been working on that right trying to work in the field of romantic relationships for parents of young children. That's basically where I'm at is trying to build that and figure out what new parents and parents of young kids want uh, in terms of relationship support, because we know it's a big problem. It's not a mystery. Like <laughs> the veil has been lifted. Most couples suffer tremendously after having kids, but you're in a weird period of time where, um, you know, where you don't have a lot of bandwidth to work on your relationship. And when you're faced with that choice between working on your relationship and having an hour of relaxing time or fun with your partner, or just watching a show, like most people choose the latter. 
what can I bring to the table that's going to support people during this time? So focusing on uh, the baby proofing your relationship with couples. So what I got is after having a child, it takes up so much bandwidth just to be a parent that, and that's a specific bandwidth that's, that's taking care of another person that when you, any free time you do have really, it's, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, um, focusing that spare time that you have on yet another relationship is all the more exhausting, but that's, but the relationship really needs that focus, um, on the other person. And, but the propensity is to take care of yourself just to have some me time. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's like, you're so, and everyone's experience is different, but I think the average is just, you're so threadbare from the demands, both mental and physical of parenting that, you know, you don't even, sometimes you don't even really feel like you have a self from which to connect to another person, right? Like every part of your identity has been, um, dominated by the parent identity. And so the idea of then going from that to being a partner feels impossible, you know, without some time to actually take care of yourself and find some sense of self again. And then there's not even enough time for that. So then there's certainly not enough time <laughs> to connect with your partner and, you know, you just, the disc, it's so easy to become super disconnected. How's the relationship suffer? Is it, so let me come at this a different way. So the way I'm imagining it is, is all that attention's on the child and is one of the partners or both partners feeling like they're not getting enough attention? How, how does the relationship suffer from that loss? Yeah, I think there's a number of different possibilities. I think like in the most cliche of the archetypes, if there's a biological mom who delivered a baby and is then breastfeeding a baby or primary caregiver for the baby, they're giving all of their attention to the kid. And so, whereas partners are used to directing attention from each other, the mom is directing attention toward the baby. The dad is directing attention toward the baby also and sort of the mom and nothing is really coming back toward the dad. And this can happen with any structure really it doesn't have to be a mom or a dad but who i think whoever is the primary caregiver and often at the very beginning there kind of has to be a primary caregiver most people are not in a financial situation where both people cannot work for some period of time or both people have equal leave or something like that you know oftentimes both people go back to work at some point but sometimes not um and so there's just this feeling of like there can be this feeling from one partner of like, I don't matter anymore. Um, and so the partner who's primary caregiver wants space, right? Cause they're basically attached to this being the entire time and need space, need to get their self back. And then the other partners had too much self, too much independence and don't know who they are in a relationship anymore. And they want that attention and that can feel really gnarly. That's certainly like a very common pattern. But I think there are lots of different things that happen. I think from more of a neutral perspective, like there's just so much dividing and conquering that you have to do and so much attention that has to be paid to making your family unit function, whether that's helping the kids survive and thrive or earning money or taking care of house stuff, cleaning, whatever it is, you know, just handling bills and all the stuff that we have to deal with in modern society that you're just so disconnected, right? It's so easy to get disconnected. You can still feel like I love this person so much. I don't even know who you are right now, right? And it can happen so quickly. And then the attempts to reconnect can feel so fraught with pressure, you know, that it doesn't, it like it doesn't go well, you fight. I heard a statistic actually um, from, there's a woman named Molly Millwood who wrote, writes about motherhood identity. And she said, couples who have kids fight nine times more often than before they had kids. Like, that's pretty crazy, you know? So there's just more stuff to fight about. You, There's more insecurity each of us has and whether we're doing a good job as a parent and how to be a parent. 
and then whatever our core sort of relational issues are between us to begin with get heavily exacerbated, I would say. Do you notice a difference in couples that have already been together for several years versus, um, let's say, uh, hypothetically, a uh, couple has been together for 10 years and then has a kid versus a couple who uh, has been together for two years and then has a kid? Is that, is, is that, the reason I'm asking is I think, you know, couples who've been together for long enough, it's like, um, what am I trying to say? Well, I'll just leave that the question. <laughs> I'll let you answer the question. I, I would say, I would say no, Okay. It, it, which is maybe a surprising answer. Yeah. I think that the amount of time that you've been together to me can work both in your favor and against your favor. Right. Because if you've been together a really long time, that might mean that you have a really good handle on how to work through conflict and really know each other well and have built like an amazing way of going on the relationship journey together. It might also mean that you're in just a huge rut. Yeah. And because there's a huge margin for error for relationships before having kids, or maybe not huge, but there's much bigger margin for error in how disconnected you can be and still kind of make it work mm -hmm. that you could be together a long time. It means nothing about how good you are at overcoming challenge together. And actually it's a much bigger disruption to your habits and the way that you've kind of built of how you deal with each other uh, and handle being in a relationship. I think so. it's like kind of like what happened with COVID right? People were forced to spend way more, like the divorce rates skyrocketed, the mm -hmm. breakup rates skyrocketed because people were forced to spend way more time together who had gotten in the habit of like, I go to work, you do this, you go to your, whatever we, you know, and that being together a long time does not necessarily mean you're able to handle challenging transitions together. Like this is what I think is what's so interesting about having kids and why Part of why I chose this time to focus on part of why I chose this time is because it's the time that I'm in and that's kind of how it works. But the other thing is, I think these massive rites of passage in our life are just so interesting, right? Like when you go from one way of being to an entirely different way of being one way of relating to yourself to like a very adjusted way of relating to yourself and just how that overlaps with partnership. Um, and I think it's more that some people I think are just better at dealing with transitions together, better at seeing their relationship as an unfolded. I, this sounds so new agey, but like an unfolding journey as opposed to something to, um, to, uh, I, I want to say maintain. It's not exactly what it is, but you know what I mean? Like some people are just trying to kind of keep things the way they are over and over again. Stay there. You stay like that. I know how to deal with that person. I don't want you to become a new person, sure. but you're forced to become new people when you have kids. And so if you're not able, I think you could maybe couch it in fixed versus growth mindset, sure. right? If you're not able to kind of take that growth, you know, unfolding journey mindset, you're kind of aft and that really doesn't matter exactly as much how long you've been together. Um, you might even have a leg up if you've been together a short amount of time because you haven't got into those habits and expectations of who your partner needs to be. Maybe you're more flexible in how you can handle it. Got it. Yeah, that makes it so right. So in other words, um, it can work against you if you're used to having it easy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. You just, you found your way, you know, we all find our ways, right? Yeah. Like we all have our strategies and habits and whatever to kind of make our days. Yeah. We can get through our days, right? I try not to live like that, you know, that I'm just getting through, but to some extent we all have to have things we can rely on to make life doable. And in relationships, it's no different. We have expectations and ways of relating to each other that we lean on and those all get exploded uh -huh. yep. <laughs> when you have kids. That makes sense. I never thought about that. So how, how do you approach the dilemma? Yeah. I've recently split, you know, I'm discovering this as I go, right? Like, as I said at the beginning, I don't totally know what people want in this, in this place. Right. I, I know what the problems are. 
and I feel like I have really good solutions to them, but like what, how, how people are, you know, how new parents are expecting parents are actually relating to what they want themselves is sort of a, a, a little bit of a, a guesswork at this point, because this has never been done basically, right? Like this niche doesn't exist. The Gottmans have done a little bit with it. Um, there's been a couple books, but mostly this isn't something we've actually looked at, even though it's extremely important, which is sort of weird, a weird cultural thing. But in any case, all that is to say, recently the insight I had was splitting first time expecting parents from people who have at least already one kid in the world. So approaching those as very, very different cohorts, excuse me. So with expecting parents, I approach it from how I've started to approach it as in the vein of like taking a labor and delivery class, taking a newborn care class, picking, you know, your, your doctor or midwife or doula or birth plan, preparing the nursery. Like this is, there are things you can prepare for, right. About how this is going to impact your relationship. Similarly to, okay, when the baby's here, I should already know how to change a diaper, right? I should already know something of how to swaddle a kid or, you know, whatever, right? All the things that we learn, I should already know what some of what's probably going to happen in my relationship and have tools of how to handle that, right? So for the expecting parents, a lot, like the biggest issue for parents is division of roles and responsibilities, like this is the number one thing that people talk about in couples therapy when their parents is like, I'm doing too much. You're not doing enough. I don't feel supported by you. And so one of the things I I've developed is a system for creating a satisfying family system, right? That's kind of how we refer to it as instead of like, how do we divide up tasks and have an equal amount of tasks? It's how do we make a satisfying and connected and fair, right? Because humans have a hard time not thinking about fairness. We kind of have to just call a spade a spade, right? How do we make a family system that functions like that? And so I've developed this way of going, here are a bunch of different things that you could need to attend to that you're each going to own. We're not going to do the you work, I do home because that's wildly unfair. Like they're even just an hour's emotional energy, however you want to parse it, that is not a fair system. So we go beyond that into all of this is included in the family system. Let's make some guesses and then let's have a way of checking in about our guesses, right? Having a family meeting, checking in about our guesses, reorganizing, right? So I have a whole process and I give people an experience of that so then they can do it for themselves as they're going on and set them up for that. And then I talk about how I, their identity is going to change, which is a big thing that people don't really understand until they experience it. But you're adding on a whole new parent self when you become a parent. And some people greatly resist this and try to be the same person they always were. And some people get completely consumed by it and lose track of themselves entirely. So I want to set people up to not fall into either of those traps. Um, I talk about sex and intimacy, of course, and expectations for having a romantic relationship and what that looks like and, you know, the issues that you're going to encounter and how to not lose your relationship, you know, but also respect and honor where each other are at. Uh, and then I talk about how to get your individual needs met um, and what that looks like um, and doing that to the best of your ability. So that's the, that's the course for expecting people. And so I'm kind of doing this thing of like, let me educate you, right? Let me give you a what to expect, right? Kind of what to expect when you're expecting for your relationship. And then let me give you perspectives, right? Things to keep in mind that you can use to kind of loosen the pain and frustration of this when you're feeling stuck with it. And then what are actual actionable tools that you can implement that are going to connect you? Because with, with the division of roles and responsibilities thing, I think a, pe a, a big thing that people miss that's kind of easy to say, but less easy to execute is two people could have the exact same task division and feel wildly different levels of satisfaction because of the underlying thing of, do we actually feel like we're in it together? Do we feel like we're a team? 
like I went on a podcast with this woman, Caitlin Murray, um, who uh, goes by big time adulting. And she was saying how she was responsible for making lunches for the kids and she was just starting to hate it and resent her husband. And so she had this brilliant idea of, let me just ask him about something he's doing during his day that's extremely tedious. And then he shared it with her and she was like, well, that sucks. I wouldn't want to have to do that for the family. Cool. This feels better. Right. And there was that sense of like, okay, we're in it together. This is what I'm taking on. It felt very different to her. So that like maintaining connection as simple as it sounds, the best that you can is really, really important. And a lot of what I'm kind of aiming for. Um, and then with people who already have kids, I have different areas that I talk about division, you know, unequal workload, communication, sex and intimacy, money stuff, parenting differences. And that's more aimed at like, here, I'm speaking to what you're already experiencing. Like here are the issues you're probably feeling, right? So there's some normalization and what we call in psychology organization, right? So you know how to think about your problem in a way that you can actually handle it or at least feel it, <laughs> but then probably do something about it. And then again, I have like principles, perspectives and action steps to address those issues. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, that's sort of a, a high level and on the ground level of what I'm, what I'm doing so far. We're, we're thinking of doing other things. Like I want to just do a straight up communication thing for individuals, because one of the problems with this is people kind of have like asynchronous times to work on this stuff. Like it's a lot to ask for people to do this exactly the same, you know, let's at 8 PM, we're both going to do this. Right. Then it gets into this, like, I'd rather watch white Lotus issue, but if you can asynchronously do something, that's going to really support you. Um, I want to find ways to do that and have a more robust, you know, creating the family system thing. Like there's lots of, I'm playing with how to best support people, but that's what I, what I've gotten to so far. Excellent. What are, so looking back at, all the work you've done with it. <clears throat> Are there some principles that you've been able to distill that have kind of risen to the top or ways that you orient to this? Yeah. Um, there definitely have. Um, I think one of them is like the, the most simple, but, but the one that I, I kind of stand by the most. And at some point, actually, this will probably become the name of the project is, um, that every experience is an opportunity to become better partners, right? Like that, the way that I think what happens for most people is you experience the conflict, you experience the tension and our orientation to that kind of stuff naturally is to try to find relief from it as soon as we possibly can, because it's really uncomfortable. And especially in parenthood, you don't have time. So I feel that you almost, it's not exactly the opposite because we're not trying to like make everything long drawn out and exhausting certainly. But when you experience tension and conflict and difficulty in early parenthood, I feel that that is an opportunity to become better partners. It's an opportunity to learn more about yourself, learn more about your partner, make new requests, try new things to support them, right? Like you are, there's no way to talk about this without <laughs> sounding like this. I, I don't think, but it's like, you're on a journey, right? Like you are on a relational journey and the more that you try to get rid of the conflict and just try to make it easier. And of course there's times when you just don't have the bandwidth and you need to make it easier. But as a principle, the more you try to do that, the more disconnected you're going to, to become. And so like number one, it's like every experience is an opportunity to grow together. So the thing I was referencing before is we were considering changing to grow together. Um, Cause that's kind of the fundamental principle of relationships for me. Like, I believe that's what made, that's what makes my marriage successful. Like, I feel a little sheepish talking about this because it just sounds kind of weird when I'm saying it, but like, I'm so happily married. Like, I'm so, so, so happy with my relationship. It doesn't mean we don't fight and have gone through periods of utter distress, 
But like what I credit my experience to is that principle more than anything else. That's just like, we're in this together. Those places where you feel like your needs are on opposite ends of a spectrum, right? Which happens in every relationship. You're like, I don't know how my need for independence and freedom and your need for merging and closeness go together. And it's like, okay, we got to creatively work on that together, right? Like I credit that view to my relationship happiness. So um, that's, that's an important one. I think it's the most important one. I think as kind of a subset of that, just looking at everything is like, how can we be on a team, right? So I'll say with parenting differences, we're on a team. We both want the most well-being for our kid and we disagree on what that means. But if we can kind of take it down to a principles level of like, I want self-reliance and I want compassion. And those two things seem to be going at odds at this point. You can kind of get on the same team of like, well, of course we want our kid to be both self-reliant and compassionate. You know, like how do we instill both of those things? So I talk about that a fair amount. Um, I don't know anything you want to say about those. I can, I can keep going. <laughs> that, I really like that. Um, <clears throat> I... Yeah, so that that makes me think of it's uh, Joseph Campbell's whole thing. The um, you know the the treasure you seek is in the cave you fear to enter. So it's a completely different orientation, or compared to I I just need to feel better right now, and <clears throat> it feels like you know getting away from this, watching White Lotus is how I'm going to feel better. And yes, and I hear that there are times for that, but the overall. Uh, orienting principle is actually to go into the tension in a constructive way, which I imagine you walk them through that, how, how to actually, um, using a, um, a fancy word, how to actually alchemize that tension into a better situation, into a better, better them and a better relationship. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm, my biggest obsession of my entire career has been communication. Mm. Um, obviously, there are non plenty of nonverbal ways in which we connect with each other. But to me, you know, the medium, the ground by which we either make this work or don't make this work is our ability to express to each other and listen to each other. So in my work, there's a lot of stuff about what we're trying to accomplish in communication, how to actually figure out what it is we're trying to get and how to figure out what it is our partner is trying to get and, you know, what's happening when there's tension and how to use that as an opportunity to connect through our words. So that's certainly a big, a big part of it for me, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, without naming names, is there, just wonder if you could give me an example of going back to the point about uh, using the tensions and going into the tensions um, and how that can actually uh, bring about um, something much greater. Uh, how, how, how might somebody uh, go about doing that? Well, I'll just give, I mean, I'll just give the example of my own life and my own marriage for the sake of ease and that I feel totally comfortable being totally transparent about it. Um, so my wife, I'm, I, I would say I err on the side of codependent. Um, you could say I, I, you could even say I'm heavily codependent. Um, that's sort of a psych, pop psychology term, but I think people understand it. It's like, I feel safe when I'm kind of like <laughs> merged with someone and there's no distance between us. My wife is the opposite, right? So you could also say this is, she's an avoidant attachment style and I'm an anxious attachment style. And in our relationship, there was a constant loop, right? This manifested different ways, but there was constant loops of, I'm not appreciating the efforts that she's putting in. I'm not giving her enough space to meet her needs. And for me, I'm, you know, she's way too distant for me. She doesn't actually want to relate to me and connect to me. She just like wants, you know, a, like to parent and then be away from me. Right. These, these are both exaggerations in case that wasn't clear, <laughs> but, um, th but that's how we felt in those moments. Right. That was the tension is, and, and, and there's these reinforcing feedback loops in relationships, right? The more I'm feeling disconnected from her, the more I'm going to try to manufacture connection. 
And the more she feels that I'm smothering her, the more she's going to try to manufacture distance. And this is a very common type of loop that people get in, right? Like a lot of anxious and avoidant people are together or however you want to organize this. And very, very easily we could get to, I'm, you know, there's no hope. Like you're never, this is just who you are. You're never going to be the type of person that finds safety and rejuvenation and being connected to me. And I'm never going to be the type of person that wants to be alone. Okay. Well, that's not how we viewed it. We viewed it as what, you know, this is where we know we're stuck, right? What can I learn more about myself? What can I learn more about you? How can we get creative? Right. That's, that's to me, it's like, there's, there's a handful of possibilities. Those possibilities are how can I get to know myself better? How can I get to know you better, right? Or connect with myself or connect with you better, empathize with you better. How can I do some actions, right? That more meet my own need. And how can I make requests from you that more meet my need, right? So it's like behaviors and kind of Inter, inner world interventions, right? That, that to me, those are basically what you can do. So for me, I went on this journey of like, is this at, like for my own purposes, is this actually how I want to feel that I'm just like terrified of feeling disconnected and alone and just get like really freaked out? No, that's very childish, right? Like this comes, like when you have kids, you are forced to confront your own <laughs> inner children, so to speak, right? Like very intensely. And I really had to look at that. Like what is happening for me when I feel disconnected such that like, this isn't even a choice I'm making. I'm just feeling this like life or death draw to like make you my everything or that's, or there's nowhere to go. And so I have learned, right? I've done therapy. I mean, there's different ways to do this. Obviously you don't have to do therapy or coaching. I personally really love therapy. Um, I've gotten into a particular type of therapy called NARM recently, which is a complex and developmental trauma therapy. And it's an attachment based therapy. And this particular dynamic that I'm talking about with my wife and I is, is would be considered an attachment dynamic meaning about how you relate to your safe places or lack thereof from parenthood or from childhood to relationships, to the way you interact with your own children. And so I found, I don't know, I, I excavated a lot of that, right? Like found more safety inside of myself, found more, I mean, this all sounds very cliche, but these things are actually quite simple. You just find your versions of them, right? Like how do I find more, at home within myself? How do I find more ways of taking care of myself? And how can I more directly ask for the things that I'm wanting, right? Like when you're coming to something as codependently as I was, you try to do it kind of sneakily because you don't want to risk the rejection, right? So it's like, oh, I'm going to get connected to you in kind of a sneaky way. And it's not very fun to be on the receiving end of that, right? It becomes a sort of like, oh, I'll do something for you. And then you'll feel appreciative of me. But then when you don't feel appreciative enough, I'm going to get mad at you, right? Like, that's not cool. It's just like, hey, would you be willing to do this? I'd like this, right? Like, I'm not one of those relational people that I think this is a spiritual overreach that like a relationship, you just, your my feelings are none of your business. Like we're just two independent, self-responsible people who like choose to interact. Like, I don't believe that. I think that's just completely ridiculous. Um, I get the principle of it. There's obviously value in that, but like, that's just not real. And I can get into that more if you'd like, but in any case, um, so it's like, how do I utilize our connection and partnership to meet my needs, but in a direct way, right? Not in a childish way. And likewise, Liz looked at how am I, keeping you at a distance? How am I afraid of being consumed by you? How am I afraid, you know, how am I cold to you, right? Like, how is this true? And what's happening for me that makes that the case? And where do for her, you know, I'll speak as her, where do for my own purposes, I distance myself from you when really I don't want to out of fear, right? And where do I, from my side, where do I try to get close to you when really actually I, I need some distance, right? Like, I think that we, you know, 
I think people get really stuck in this thing of like, the only reason I do this change is because that's what you want for me. And I actually think that's a fine doorway in partnership. Like we care about each other that much to try and make changes for each other. But I think deep down, we'll always find something in it. Like no one really wants to be really out of balance where you're like over fixated on relying on independence or dependence. Like we all, our systems seem to tend to move toward balance. And like, if you really look at it, probably the things that you're really attached to aren't perfectly serving you. Um, you know, and so we find those places within ourselves and then Liz can be more direct of like, Hey, I actually, I just want 10 minutes of alone time. And then I'd love to like talk to you or, you know, like, let's make sure we find time to have, you know, to have sex or like have some intimate connection. Right. Or like being more straightforward about sharing her attraction to me or whatever it is. Right. Like the things that I want come out when she's actually thinking about more deeply, like, how do I want to be and vice versa? Um, so it's just, I think that's a very long winded answer to your question, but that's, I think how you do it is like, you go beyond the first stopping point. The first stopping point is, oh, this is how I am. And this is how you are. And we're incompatible. And I don't see any way through this. I don't think anyone is just anything infinitely. Like the world is changing. We're all changing. Like you actually have to try pretty hard <clears throat> to not change. And I think if we can look beyond that and, and get creative, we find intersections like people obsess. If, if I, if I took care of myself, you're saying I'd have to do that all the time and you'd never want to connect with me. If I connect with you, then that's going to be all the time. And I'm never going to have time for myself. And it's like, everything's extrapolated out into infinity. And it's like, no, most people just need to get their needs met for pretty short. And then they feel satisfied, you know, like we're not actually as dramatically needy or complicated as we like to think we are, in my opinion. <clears throat> you said something that caught my ear just a little bit ago. You said, <clears throat> when we have kids or when we have children, we meet our own inner children or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think it's true in a number of ways. Um, one way I think it's true is that you, I'll just speak for myself, but I think this is true from everyone I've talked to. Like you see yourself in your kids. I see myself in my kids. Right. So I see the way they react to things, the experiences they're having. And I don't know. I don't think we, from my understanding, we're not totally sure how much of anything is nature versus nurture or genetics or some sort of spiritual thing or whatever. But suffice it to say, I see the way I react to things in the way my kids react to things. And I remember stuff. I remember experiences from my childhood that I have forgotten. I remember ways I interacted with my parents based on ways that they're interacting with me. I remember ways my parents interacted with me based on how I'm interacting with my kids. Right. And so you were, I think most people I've talked to you say this, you remember so much more of your childhood experience through having kids. And it's really, really wild. I think that's one thing. The other thing is like our nervous systems are just so threadbare in parent in early parenthood that like your worst kind of default reactive habits, which some models of psychology would refer to as child consciousness, uh, come up quite easily, right? Like you're kind of, not that I'm advocating, we should be like curated and even and whatever, you know, all the time. It's not that right. Like having feelings and sometimes even quite big feelings is very much what needs to happen. But that kind of like reactive, like this is just all like I'm shutting down or I'm exploding or whatever, that sort of child, more childish, immature ways of being come out much more easily. And I think whatever our specific issues are, right, of who we are, like the stuff that we're working out in our lives you know, the things about our egos or identities or behaviors that are hard for us and make us uncomfortable or we're curious about or whatever, like those things are going to flare up a lot when you're faced with the challenge of being a parent and taking care of another person and not having the free, you know, 
I don't have the freedom to do whatever I want. That's the choice I made. I, that's what I, the life path I took to have kids. And that's a different kind of thing, but that doesn't mean that every moment of every day I'm stoked that I can't go play golf or go on a trip or whatever, you know, sometimes I'm bratty about it and I don't want that choice, <laughs> you know? So you really face whatever is kind of developmentally left over from your own experience of becoming a, becoming an adult. Yeah. Very cool. So you have, tell me about the, the different ways that people can engage, um, with your, with you and with your products. Is it, is it one-on-one -on -one only? I mean, not, to, so you have the course, I'll let you speak about it. Yeah, sure. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Um, I mean, one, like one way of just getting to know me right now is on social media. I'm just posting a lot of stuff on social media, trying to give, you know, share things that I think and just things about myself on stories and stuff. And, uh, our Instagram is, uh, at baby proofing your relationship. Um, so that's a great way to interact with me and get to know me. Like we also have a mailing list and every two weeks I send out a newsletter, which is about something that's happened to me or something I've been thinking about in my own life recently. I try to just talk a lot about my own experience, not try to overdo it, but I don't know. I want people to know who I am and know that I know what I'm talking about and they can trust me and everything. So, um, I also have appeared on a handful of podcasts and, um, our website is babyproofingyourrelationship.com and we have links to a handful of those things. So there's all of that. And then in terms of working with me for, um, expecting parents, first time expecting parents, we, our course is called baby proofing your relationship, essential prep. And every month I teach a one and a half hour evening workshop, um, alternating between in-person in the Bay area and virtual on zoom so that anyone can do it. Mm. Um, and it's 50 bucks. It's really reasonable. And so that's that, you know, getting set up to know what to expect for your relationship. Um, actually this weekend, I am going to record an on-demand version of that so that people can do nice. just the videos and do it on their own time. Yeah. And then, um, then we have baby proofing your relationship connect through the chaos, which is for people who already have at least one kid. And <laughs> that is a video based on-demand course. And then also, um, I don't coach anymore, but I've trained, I like organized and modeled the way that I do couples work, um, which is some amount of a synthesis of things I've, I've learned along the way and, and some amount just kind of my own thing. Um, and so I've trained a few coaches to work in my way of working on things. So sometimes I know that like just digesting video content leaves you with a lot of questions or sometimes you try to implement it and it's not that easy. And so there's also like a bundle where you get a discount if you add on a coaching session yes. or you can work with one of our coaches ongoingly. So that's what we have right now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I'm really excited about in the works like this, this system for creating a family system, dividing roles and responsibilities, the communication stuff. Um, we're actually going to divide the connect through the chaos course into a la carte modules as well. So you can just do the thing that is actually problematic for you at the moment, right? right? For like a lot cheaper, just, I just want the sex and intimacy stuff. Like yeah. we're going to do that as well. So, uh, that's what we got so far. That's how people can, can reach me and interact with me. Also, I'll say I, I like. I used to really not like social media. I've developed kind of a love of interacting with people on social media. Yeah. So like, if you message me or comment on any of my videos, like I 100% will respond and have probably like a way too long conversation with you about <laughs> anything that you're thinking about. So feel free to do that as well. I'm not super precious. I'm not like, you can only access me if you pay. Like I, I love talking to people. That's why I started here. So. Awesome. Yeah, that seems very clear. Anything that I missed? Um, I sort of wanted to just comment on the thing I said about the, um, the, uh, the attachment thing, the spirit, that it's a spiritual overreach to say that like, we're too self-responsible, independent people. Um, cause I think this is, I think this is a really interesting 
theory right now. Like I, I think about this a lot, you know, and it's, I mean, I could make bio, like there's a scientific argument for this, which is basically attachment theory and just our biology and how our nervous system sort of sync up with each other. Like people are not in, like, it's just, people are just not independent of each other. Mm -hmm. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. And so the way that this gets put on relationships is we've gone like way the other direction of like, I, I'm totally responsible my, for myself. I'm responsible for my feelings. I'm responsible for my happiness. And like, I sort of dip into our relationship when it suits both of us or whatever. And I think that's just not how it works. Um, and I, I, I like really caution people against thinking this way, right? Like I need to love myself first before I can love another person is another example of this. Like relationships are really, really messy. Mm. Like the, the, the principle of, I think what's being expressed that is valuable is a relationship is not an agreement to put all your shit on another person, mm -hmm. right? Like that's not what a relationship is. And certainly, you know, the model that I fell into of like, of feeling really codependent and just overly attached and like needing safety in another person, that's not a great place from which to do a relationship. But also I learned that in the, the, you know, the, the space of my marriage, like I faced up against those issues and learned those issues. And I think that the idea that we can just be totally independent and self-responsible is I think just a way of feeling some sense of control and relief from the fact that we are really affected by other people. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're in a partnered bond with them. And so I just think, you know, we are finding this balance, like when you were saying, you know, alchemizing tension into, into connection, like to me, this relates to that. It's, it's, it's not about distancing yourself and it's not about collapsing into another person. It's about honoring that, like, I am affected by my partner. My partner is affected by me. They can affect my happiness and make me happier and meet my needs and vice versa. And also if I'm completely dependent on them to meet every need and make me feel good all the time, we're not, that's not going to work. And if we're completely independent and have, and pretending we have no effect on each other and refuse to rely on each other and be influenced by each other at all, that's also not going to work. Right. And so I just, this is something that's really important to me from like, uh, I want to shout it from the rooftops sort of thing of just like please stop. Like, I feel like our generation is waiting so long to choose people. Like, I think that's totally fine. If you don't want to be in a relationship or like, you know, you're, if you're talking about a life partner, you should be patient, right? Like you should not just jump into that. But on the other hand, I feel like people want partnership and they're not choosing it because they hear these platitudes like, well, you need to love yourself first or, you know, you're responsible for your own happiness and you need to be responsible for your feelings. And, you know, like, don't be in, like to keep being yourself in relationship and like, it's damaging. Yeah. Like, I think it's really damaging. Yeah. It's an idealism. And I get that life's not rarely does it match the idealism. And so you got to get a little, <laughs> get a little messy. Yeah. Well, it's the, and it's funny cause it's the inverse idealism to you complete me. Yeah. Right. Which is also an idealism. Yes. Right. Like this seems to be what happens. We just overcorrect, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to overcorrect from that to another overcorrection. And hopefully we're kind of finding our way to, yeah. you know, including all the different pieces. But, um, I know I just, I think it's so, it so bothers me how much traction that's gained. Um, cause like, so it's causes so much suffering in people I've worked with and also just a way to beat yourself up. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I shouldn't have been affected by that, or I don't love myself enough. It's like, whoa, you you deserve to be in a relationship. Like, it's okay. You don't have to be perfect. I think we did it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you. It was really nice to chat with you. <laughs>